We conclude now chapter 49. Now that it says, based on everything that we learn, again, in our prayers every day, the blessings of the Shema are to lead us to the oneness of God, where we will love him with both hearts. What are the two hearts that we love him with? Not just with the divine, but even the animal soul also loves God. How does the animal soul love God? By setting aside its human need for love, for a divine form of love. That means the human need for love that we have of others becomes exalted into a divine form of love, as we explained at great length in previous class. That it means not what I needy for to express my need of love, but what I'm needed for. That's how it will be expressed. That's a divine form of love. What does that do? That means you set aside your own agenda. Your own agenda is human needs, human love. You're putting that aside. That's called love. That is uh, co contracting. It is um, impelling, squeezing the flesh, the heart. Squeezing and moving back a bit rather than giving a, an embrace, right? As we told the story with the Rebbe Rasha, a Hasidic kiss, instead of giving the kiss to his son, he gave something that would be meaningful for him as an expression of love that would be meaningful to him. So the Altair of it says that any thinking person who reflects on these matters in your heart, with your mind, then you're going to mirror back that which God has done to us, for us. Put aside everything, right? God has put aside everything just for, for us, that we can have a relationship with him. So that should then kindle the love that I should have for God to a um, set aside my agenda, my human condition, my human needs, then don't become what is I base my life on. And that what, what would that mean? That I want to connect to God. Because that's what God needs from me. That's what he wants. He puts aside for me, I'll put aside for him. And I will now learn Torah, as we're doing right now. Which is a divine kiss. Right? Just as a kiss has two elements, two lips that come together. There's also an exchange of a breath, as we've explained. That, that the kiss means I'm saying the words of Torah. The breath is about my spirit being connected with the spirit of God right and that's what we say in the Shema that we say that these words the words of Torah should be on our heart that we should speak them should be immersed in Torah study which allows my mind to be bound up with the divine intelligence and I should speak the words because when I speak the words right what happens if I only think the words of Torah so my spirit is bound up but when I speak them my speaking is engaging now my animal soul because my animal soul gives vitality to my physical body to be able to speak the words so that means in the Torah that is being studied I'm engaging now my animal soul and body. That it too, it too, is engaged in the mitzvah. Um, which is powerful. In other words, what you're doing is bringing that love of God, not only expressed in your divine soul, 
when you would just think the words of Torah, for example. But when you express it, you're, expre you're bringing that love of God also to your animal, vivifying soul, that it too now gets elevated and bound up with God. And this is what God created. This is the service that he created for us. He is, this is the ultimate purpose, that the infinite light of God, which is concealed through the act of creation, somewhat revealed in the more spiritual worlds that the angels up there and, and so on are, are, are at least get a glimmer of that. But his full glory is down here, they say. Where, where it's totally removed. God sets aside that which is more of his natural inclination, spiritual worlds above, puts that aside for the love that he has for us so that, that he contracts, creates us as independent. Then now we have the choice that so we could walk away from him. But what he wants is we walk towards him and engage him and we put aside our human condition for the love of him he puts aside his condition we put aside our condition his condition is, is more of an intimate spiritual world he puts that all aside for us so we reciprocate by putting aside our human condition in order that we can have a relationship with him and through that how through Torah mitzvahs that we can bring down and express him in my life him in this world the infinite light that should be drawn down below that is um reciprocating that's water that re re reflects mirrors the image of what has been shown to in the in the reflection this is what god shows us this is what we reflect back that we want the relationship. We want the connection. How? Through, as we're doing right now, learning, through another mitzvah, that that elicits the essence of God that we become connected to. Just as that's expressed um, when we can put down, uh, aside the human conditions, need for neediness that we have in love, and we put that aside for a divine that what does that mean in human in, in human terms that means i'm connecting to you rather than what i need from you i need from you a hug right now so i'm con not really connecting to you i'm only connecting what i need from you rather than of you when i'm able to put that aside and to connect to you to the core of you, then I'll be much more sensitive to your particular needs and the core of you that I want to be connected to. So I'm going to put aside my neediness in order that I could truly be there for you. It's the same thing, God. That's the same thing we do with God. I put aside what my human needs are in order that I can have a relationship with God. Then that relationship is going to touch the core and essence of God. Beyond being the creator. Beyond having, you know, the, the title of God as creator. God and creator, he puts all of the act of creation aside. And the act of creation is he makes angels. He makes spiritual worlds. All of that aside of no relevance and importance. What's important is you and I down here. That's what he cares. For a simple little thing that we can renounce our human condition in order that we can be connected to God through a mitzvah. And, 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 and reveal that essential bond and connection with him in our lives, in our souls, in our even animal soul, because the animal soul is engaged in doing the mitzvah too. And um, that touches the very core and essence of God. Any questions, any comments?
Any thoughts? Marjan. Hello, Marjan. Hello, Hello, Rabbi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this amazing class. Um, Rabbi, I also have a question about this concept of uh, chosenness, being part of the chosen people, and conversion. And the reason that I'm asking this is that I'm in the process myself. Um, if the person who is converting is making this choice, and it's 100% their choice, I, I have a hard time reconciling this with the concept of chosenness, because they were not chosen to be born that way. Is it that even the conversion itself is um, how perhaps they were chosen? I mean, are they choosing to be chosen? Or <laughs> they were chosen to <laughs> make this choice? This is something I have a hard time understanding. So, yeah, good question. Good question. Thank you. Um, we um, we think we're you know we're, we're we think we're making choices all the time, right? Are we? Are we compelled to choose? Like, um, if I react in a certain way, is it because that's my natural response, and therefore I did it, so to speak, on autopilot? and I responded in a certain way, it's that I wasn't free to choose. The only time you're free to choose is when you would have a natural reaction and you are able to bite your tongue, hold back, and choose a higher form of response that's based on your godly, divine soul, um, and that you choose that. Now, sometimes it might just be another rational choice rather than something that's truly from you know the divine soul that's true we can go back and forth in arguments between in the rationality but if it's based on what god needs from me not based on my uh, rational choosing what does god need from me then that's coming from a deeper part within me that's not compelling me. Why am I saying that? Because, you know, is someone who converts according to Jewish law, are they choosing? On one level, yes. On another level, no, they have a spark of a Jewish soul in them, and that's what's compelling them from the inside. Right? Or, or right, now, the choice is, am I going to l listen to that inner spark within me and therefore follow and and do things the way god needs it which by the way just make sure that you're doing it according to halacha um and uh, if you need some guidance in that you can reach out privately um but uh, thank you rabbi yeah but it's a deeper I'm thing i'm doing it according to halacha okay with the toronto bay thing uh, but I've always had a hard time understanding how this works with the concept of being chosen. I always had this question, is it me making this choice or I was chosen to make this choice? And you explained it very well. Thank you. Uh, it's okay. very helpful. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it, it, like it, in the end, it becomes like it's, it's a two-way thing. We were, you, you know... Y for whatever reason you were chosen, like for whatever, why, why was I chosen that I should have it? Uh, you know, my mother is Jewish and my, her mother is Jewish and all the way back, uh, you know, as far as I know, at least, you know, uh, why? So God chose, right? Now, why is it someone that was chosen to have a spark of a Jewish soul that they should, that they will convert? Well, because that's what God chose. Now, just because I have a Jewish soul, and you have a spark of one that you're going through now in your process of, of conversion. I still have the choice to listen to my Jewish soul and act accordingly, right? And you have a choice to listen to the spark of that soul that you have and act accordingly or not. We, we have that. But to begin with, it's something beyond us that we can at least be attuned to. Okay, Michelle.
Go ahead, Michelle. Hi, Hi, Hi. Michelle. Welcome. Um, I, I came in literally only 10 minutes ago, so uh, please excuse me. No um, But I just wanted to understand something because chosen people, we're always thinking that we're chosen, but wasn't it us, the Israel, that chose God? He didn't choose us. So, uh, on one level, that's true. I, I think maybe that ties in with the idea that we're speaking about now, right? On one level, we chose God. On a deeper level, why did we choose God? Because he chose us. Um, in other words, there's some. if it's because we chose God merely, so then there's nothing inherent and it's just because, you know, <laughs> like Abraham, he was a smart guy. And, you know, while he was, uh, you know, dealing with uh, uh, lofty spiritual and heavy duty things and the others were, you know, whatever. So so there's a truth to that. And, and he is the one who recognized. But once the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, then our Jewishness is based on our soul it wasn't based on our journey before that you know if being jewish before the giving of the torah so if you threw your lot with the jewish people and you believed in god you're jewish there are some you know some sects in judaism that believe that today that's pre-giving the torah once the torah was given even moses himself became a convert he, he became a convert Everybody then became a convert. What does that mean they became a convert? It means that now Jewishness is based on soul. It's based on a soul that we know we identify it by the Jewish mother or by someone who converted according to halacha. That's how we identify that the person has a Jewish soul, but it's something that God imbues us with, that Jewish soul. We didn't choose it. It's a given to us. So that's what happened by the giving of the Torah um, that became unique from that moment on. And that's unique. No other people on earth or even other religions make that claim. Other religions say that if you buy into the dogma, uh, then you are a believer of that particular faith, right? So if you accept this person that he is your savior, so now this is your part of that faith group. But as a Jew, if you're born a Jew, or convert and become a Jew, then that is what you are, no matter what you believe, right? And by the way, it's an interesting thing. If you go up to a, a, a Jew who is not um, observant at all, and he'll say, um, listen, uh, do you eat kosher? So how do you eat kosher? What? You know. We don't have to, we have refrigeration today. We don't have to worry about all the diseases that would have come from the past. So uh, that's nonsense. So, okay, do you at least, uh, do you fast on Yom Kippur? Are you kidding? That's ham and cheese day, right? So you say, well, do you at least believe in God? Uh, you know, Mondays and Thursdays, maybe I sometimes have an inkling, you know. So now go to that person and you'll say to him, you know, you're not Jewish. You don't even believe in the basics of Judaism. So more often than not, that what that Jew will do is slap you across the face and say to you, I am Jewish. I'm as Jewish as you are. Now think about it. That's ridiculous. You know, if you went to someone in another faith and you, you know, and they'll, they'll tell you, yeah, I don't, you know, I was born into that faith, but uh, I don't really believe it anymore. Yeah. Okay. But here, this Jew is going to slap you across the face. Why? Like I'm as Jewish as you are. And the truth is, that person's right. He is. Or she is. Why? Because you're not Jewish because you bought into the dogma. You're Jewish because you have a soul that was given to you um, by God. And that's what makes you Jewish, period. So, well, you know, the answer to that person is, well, if you got that Jewish soul, then might as well at least uh, then be true to it. That Jewish soul means, you know, no ham and cheese. That means fasting and kipper. It means 
God is integral to your life. That's the expression, how the soul will express itself. But if uh, one doesn't uh, buy into that, it doesn't mean they are not that. They are. So that's a given. That's not something that we create. Um, does that help, Michelle? Yeah, does my, does my Jewish soul connect more to another Jewish soul rather than someone who's not Jewish, do you think? Very good question. Um, well, look what happened in, in Meron. Uh, people that we don't know, and, and, and yet, you know, the feeling of uh, a connectivity is very, very much so. So there is a natural, um, a natural connection that we feel to a fellow Jew. Now, the truth is some people, their Jewishness might be so removed from them and their connection to it might be so removed that they feel no uh, natural affinity to, to another Jew. But I think, you know, for the most part, that would be the case that there is that kind of an affinity and uh and we do feel that that connection that and by the way that doesn't mean you even have to like the person right it just we just feel that more of a natural affinity and bond to them actually um uh, let me just give a quick story to that um uh, rabbi um uh rabbi rabbi uh no rabbi doctor who just passed away from pittsburgh um this year uh Tversky. Tversky, thank you very much Thank you. Rabbi Tversky was once standing by a by a bus stop and uh, an elder when he was much younger uh, as a young man and a, and a woman, a Jewish woman, elderly Jewish woman says, this is a, a, a bush and a shanda, he says, in, she says in Yiddish, it's a, a, you're a, you're a shameful individual. Look at the way you dress. Look at the way you are. Um, you know, we're in the 20th century. Why are you dressing in this archaic Europe, Eastern European dress of yours? Like, come on. So he turns to her and says, excuse me, ma'am, ma I'm Amish. So she said, oh, oh, my apologies. Oh, I have such respect for the Amish that they keep their tradition. They keep their way. They're such a phenomenal, great people. And so I says, and then he turns to her and says in Yiddish, uh, and he says, uh, um, uh, uh, um, a, minute freer, a, a minute earlier when you thought I was Jewish, I was despicable. Now I'm Amish, I'm respectful. Is, you know, so what? What is it? Very simple, because there is an affinity that she had to him as being a Jew. It was a reflection of her. She didn't like that reflection, and therefore she was embarrassed herself. Not that he's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed with you because we're, you know, of the same ilk. Same, you know, I, I'm embarrassed with you, and that's what Did she. Did you say that was Rabbi Tversky? Yeah, Rabbi Tversky. Yes. I read one of his books. Did you? Uh, are you familiar with his story about the lobster? Yes, yes, a beautiful story. <laughs> yes. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Oh, what happened to Eric? Oh, there you go. Eric, please share. Eric, please share with us. I'm sorry. Um, I'm calling you from Jerusalem. So. Mm. Um, oh I, boy. Curious to know whether in the Chabad world you believe that uh, Jewish souls are superior to the souls of others. And um, so th th that is a very loaded question when you say the word superior um, because of the connotation of it. So um, a, a Jewish soul is different. It has a different purpose that it needs to fulfill than a non-Jewish soul um, and it has its uniqueness um, we've dealt with it in the past at, at great length this concept um, it has a unique um, relationship with God um, and uh, but what the consequence of that is is not that we are superior and therefore you're inferior to be subjugated um but you are but we are as a result of that responsible for the rest of the nations of the world and that's the idea of being a light on to the nations 
because of the uniqueness of the Jewish soul and the special unique relationship that it has with God, um, we become responsible for, you know, all nations of the world as a result. So, um, um, but yes, there is something special and unique about the about the Jewish soul. So the word superior, um, if we put it in the sense of, you know, in in the uh, if we put it in the sense of let's say in the hierarchy of uh, of um, uh, of the army, you know, a private versus uh, a, a lieutenant versus uh, the major versus the the general. So you know, is there a hierarchy and and so on? Yes, there is. Everybody has their role they need to play in you know um, in in the world. And in that respect, you know, uh, we become responsible to make sure that everybody ultimately plays that role. Is that? Um... The, the challenge, the challenge, uh, uh, Rabbi, is that that we have been accused by our Gentile neighbors of feeling that we are superior, and it has been a um, an excuse, uh, an excuse for anti-Semitism that that you know that we we believe that that Jews are superior. Now I know that doesn't come from the Torah. Is this something from the Zohar or from other mystical texts? Um. Well, for, first of all, you know, interesting. Uh, Torah was given at Sinai in Hebrew Sinai, and the, and the Talmud tells us that when the Torah was given to the Jewish people and made us the chosen people, as we spoke about earlier, right, the chosenness of the Jewish people, as we went into detail about that earlier, that um, that created from the word Sinai, Sinai, Sina, hatred. The fact that the Jewish people are the chosen people um, and that we got Torah at Mount Sinai, that created hatred towards the Jew. And there's many layers of understanding what why that is. And on, on one simple layer of understanding is because since the Jewish people are to be a light onto the nations, are to be the conscience of the world, um, many people don't like that. You know, they don't like um, the fact that, you know, that a Jew is um, acting different and through acting different and is trying to teach that we all need to be um, not given to the natural instinct of the human condition or the human nature. And we have to, you know, here to serve God rather than to be served. Um, many people don't like that. Many people, so that itself just brings a natural hatred just by the very fact of who we are um, and ultimately what our unique role and mission is in this world. Yeah. Interesting about the uniqueness issue, if I just may just want to make one more comment. Sure. The first pogrom in, that ever happened in history, the first anti-Semitic acts that ever happened in history, happened in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and it was, I don't know, about 2,100 years ago, because the Jews refused to intermarry with the native Egyptians and kept themselves as a separate people. It was looked upon by the Egyptians as something bad, and that was the first pogrom, the first uh, anti-Jewish riot uh, that ever occurred in history. It's our unique uh, that we call ourselves to um, you, what you say is uh, unique souls, however you want to define it, our uniqueness, uh, our separateness. Uh, that has uh, angered the world. Um, I, I thought that, that turn of a phrase that you made about C9 was very interesting, and I never heard it before. So uh, all the best to you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Actually, Eric, I just want to add something to the point that you just made. Um, many moons ago, um, I think it was B'nai B'rith organization did a study on anti-Semitism, um, and they found that the main reason, not the only reason, so uh, I'm underlying that, 
not the only reason, but the greatest catalyst towards anti-Semitism is Jews assimilating. We see that in the Spanish Jewry in, uh, um, in, the, in, uh, under, in 1492 when the Jews were expelled from, from Spain. We see that uh, Jews in, in Germany, what happened in Germany, and, and many other instances throughout our history. The greatest cat, again, not the only, Again, don't be, be very careful. It's not the only, but the greatest catalyst towards anti-Semitism is Jews assimilating. Um, I'll explain why. It's because a non-Jew knows that a Jew is different. We eat different. We act different. You know, we have a, a Sabbath. We have a holiday. We eat we have certain things we don't eat, right? We, we are different. That itself may be an issue of contention, but what's a greater issue of contention is that the Jew who's supposed to be different and doesn't respect themselves in their own difference, why should I respect them? Oh, you're trying to be like us? But you're not. You're really not. So who are you fooling? You're trying to fool us with something. Hmm. That is the greatest cause. And again, I, I'm not the one who's saying this. It's not Chabad that is making that statement. It was B'nai B'rith. I'm just explaining what B'nai B'rith didn't under, didn't have the explanation of why would it be that Jews assimilating should be, that that should be the cause of the least amount of assimilation, but it's the cause of the greatest amount of assimilation because in the end a non-Jew knows that a Jew is different. So if we don't act differently, it means you're not respectful of your own, you know, culture of your own place in this world of of who you are. So then that will lead to a lack of respect. And so on and so forth. I hope that was clear. And, and please send our our love and um, and heartfelt um, uh, condolences to everybody in the holy city and throughout the holy land. And uh, we just with that we should all do something extra for uh, for all those souls that have departed and all those souls that, and all those people that need a uh, complete and speedy recovery should uh, add in our Torah learning, add in, in, in doing something wonderful. All right. Rabbi, could I ask you a question? Sure, um, go ahead. Regarding souls. Um, I heard once that a baby soul chooses the mother. Is this correct? I never heard that. I haven't heard that. So I don't know what to respond to that since I haven't heard it. <laughs> um, you don't know where... I think I heard it in a shiur once many years ago and it's something that always uh, I remember, you know, you put things away at the back of your head. Right. And, um, and so I just wanted that confirmed. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I can't confirm it because I, I don't recall hearing that. Okay. Thank okay, well, thank you. All right, folks, I want to thank everybody. Um, it's a long class. Beautiful. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, thank you, Bachi. So thank you, everybody. Much. Thank you all. We'll uh, continue tomorrow at 9.30. Um, a reminder, tonight I give a class at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time uh, on the Torah portion. It's on Facebook, Chabad ZK, on Zoom, 770-770-6085. Um, you can catch it on Zoom. And um, we will continue our conversation. I'm Rabbi Ronnie Fine coming to you from Chabad Zuch and in Montreal, Canada, where it's a privilege and a pleasure to share with you, Tanya. Have a wonderful day. A good Thank you, folks. Thank you all. Amazing.